Mm-hmm. So, um, this so this week or so next week and the week after, we are not going to have any presentations. We have um, GSA conference here in the states and other conferences the following week. So we're going on a two-week hiatus, and we'll come back on. Um, we'll come back with Stephanie Olson from Purdue on October 27th. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing you all then. Until then, enjoy your conferences. Um, today, uh, Andre is going to go ahead and in introduce our speaker for us. Um, but uh, it, I, we'll have a normal, well, it'll, it'll be just as always, we'll have about 45 minutes of speaking and then followed by a question session. And um, that will open up at the end that uh, everybody can ask their question either via the chat or raising their hand. And I'll address them in the order we get them received. So please, Andre, uh, introduce Dr. Claire Buckles for us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to introduce Claire Buchholz uh, from uh, California Institute of Technology. Claire got uh, her undergraduate degree at Yale in 2009 and she already started to work on geochemical and petrological problems. And she continued uh, during PhD at, I guess, uh, MIT Woods Hole joint program, working on subduction complex in Mongolia. And uh, in general, uh, class interest in geochemistry and petrology of subduction zone, formation of continental crust, and uh, early Earth evolution. So with this, I pass uh, to Claire, and she will talk today about linking surface and igneous sulfur isotope records across the great ox oxygenation event. Okay, well, thanks so much, Alex and Andre, uh, for the invitation, and thanks for the invitation to speak today. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And the, the work that I'm going to be talking about today is one aspect of the work that I've been doing recently, <clears throat> trying to understand how changes at, at the uh, Earth's surface throughout Earth's history uh, might have been imprinted on the, the igneous rock record. And before I um, dive into it, I just want to recognize uh, a number of people who are involved in this project. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's really the work that I'm going to present today is a uh, is the, the work of uh, a lot of collaboration and a lot of hard effort on, on a number of people's um, uh, parts. So um, Joe Biasi here uh, was a grad student at Caltech. He's now a, um, an NSF postdoc at, at Dartmouth, but he helped a lot with some of the field work that I did in the, the Superior Craton, um, looking at the Ghost Lake Bathlith, which I'll talk more about uh, in, in a little bit. <clears throat> I've also worked really closely both with Chris Spencer and Jana Liebman, who, um, <clears throat> while uh, Jana was doing her graduate work at Curtin University, Chris was there. He's now at Queen's University. Um, but uh, some of the work that I might be presenting is um, the thesis work of, of Jana's. Um, Isabel Jeannot, working with Pierre Carny, has also helped out. Um, trying to do some bulk sulfur isotope analyses on igneous rocks um, to, uh, I'll get into it too, to a lot of hard work, but not, not a lot of success just due to the, the lack of sulfur in these rocks. And then I've also worked um, closely with Patrick Beaudry and Shu Aono at MIT. Um, so all of these people are really integral into the study. <clears throat> and I, I realize that this is a, a more specialized audience, but I'll just go ahead and um, start off just with an, an overview of the great oxygenation event and why we're interested in sulfur isotopes to make sure that everyone here is is on the same page. Um, so this is this is a timeline put together uh, from the the Hadean all the way to the the Phanerozoic, um, showing various uh, uh, observations in the the geologic rock record uh, that have that led people to, to realize that there was something quite fundamental happening um, in the early Proterozoic. And even before um, I get into sort of the sulfur isotope story here, you know, the, the Archean Proterozoic transition was a big deal and people knew it just from wandering around and, and looking at, at rocks. Um, and so now the great oxygenation event um, has been um, documented to, to have occurred in the early Proterozoic around 2.3 to 2.4 billion years ago. Um, and even before, as I said before, that 
sort of these sedimentary sequences were able to be uh, dated precisely and we were able to look at geochemical signals there, um, there were some very macroscopic um, <clears throat> lines of evidence that the, the concentrations of oxygen in the atmosphere were, were quite different um, prior to about uh, well, broadly the Archean Proterozoic transition, but you know, 2.3 to 2.4 billion years ago. Um, so just to run through some of these, um, <clears throat> you find oxygen sensitive detrital grains in uh, Archean and earliest Paleoproterozoic uh, succession. So for example, here, here's a picture of detrital um, pyrite from the Mississauga Formation in Ontario. Um, and you can see that they're they're nicely rounded and suggests that these pyrite grains were, were transported under uh, conditions of low uh, O2 in the atmosphere. Um, you know, in, in modern day, these would just be oxidized and and weathered away. And as you went, as people were looking at the rock records, they found that you only found these um, prior, uh, basically, in Archean rocks. And then. Um, if we actually start to look at redox sensitive uh, major elements, um, such as iron, for example, and also sulfur, there are also observations that these were behaving differently. So for example, red beds, which are you know, indicative of, of oxidized iron um, in these uh, sandstones were only present and found after um, the, the, proter the, sorry, the, the paleoproterozoic, so only starting after this inferred oxygenation event. Um, and then also there's there's a difference in the the behavior between iron. So in the um, in the Archean, iron is is lost or leached from um, um, from sedimentary rocks and paleosols. So this is indicative of it being in its soluble form or its reduced ferrous form, whereas it starts to be retained as hematite and paleosols into the uh, into the Proterozoic. You also start to see the um, the occurrence of sulfate deposits going into the Proterozoic. So all of these these both iron and sulfur are going from you know reduced forms to more oxidized forms across this this event. And then what perhaps um, was one of the the most major discoveries around the Great Oxygenation event was the the observ observation of mass independent fractionation of sulfur isotopes in the um, <clears throat> prior to uh, 2.3 billion years ago. And after that, um, the, the total um, uh, absence of, of mass independent, large scale mass independent fractionation of, of sulfur. Um, so to get into that in a little bit more detail, because that's going to be the focus of the talk today, I'll just give a quick overview on, on sulfur isotopes and the notations that I'm going to be using. Um, so sulfur has four stable isotopes. I'm going to be talking about 32, 33, and 34S today. So 32S is the most abundant at about 95%. Um, and there's two notations I'll be using. There's the, the delta notation, um, which is simply a per mil deviation um, from a, a standard reference value. And most uh, isotopic fractionations are going to be um, caused by effects uh, of the mass of an isotope, either on bond strengths or molecular uh, velocities or diffusivities. And for this reason, they should fall along a, a predictable trend that's related to the differences between their masses. So if we look at delta 33S here and delta 34S here, they should fall on a line with a slope of about a half. Um, because that's uh, <clears throat> uh, dependent on the relative difference of their masses, which is from 32s, which is about a half as well. Um, and any deviation from this, then I'm going to introduce the, the cap delta um, 33s uh, notation uh, is any deviations from this mass dependent fractionation line um, are is considered mass independent fractionation. And so you can have uh, uh, either positive deviations, if it falls above this line, or, or negative deviations. So if we go back to the, the sedimentary rock record, and I apologize that I, I realize I'm going to show a couple of timelines in this talk, and sometimes they're going to be going from left to right and right to left in terms of aging. So just try to, to calibrate yourself when I show them. But now I'm showing cap delta 33S. Um, for sedimentary rocks in the um, uh, across Earth history, and you can see that prior to 2.3 billion years ago, you can you have large, you know, tens per, of per mil in some cases, uh, cap delta 33s values, and after that, um, this signal is eliminated from the rock record. So it's it's very striking, and the the reason that people associate this or, or think it's due to 
um, low concentrations of oxygen in the atmosphere is that um, <clears throat> the, these signals are thought to happen through SO2 photolysis reactions. And the, the UV radiation which drives this is generally blocked by um, oxygen and ozone in the atmosphere. So you, you need to have very low concentrations of, of oxygen in order to allow this UV radiation to, um, to, to uh, you know, transit through the, the atmosphere and, and create these mass independent fractionations. So we can look at this, uh, the, the sedimentary rocks uh, data in a, a different way too, that's, that's commonly looked at. It's delta 33S versus delta 34S. And this is just for the pre um, 2.3 billion year old um, sedimentary rocks. Uh, and what you can see here is that um, there's a relatively limited range in delta 34S um, from you know, negative 20 to, to 20 on the far end, but most of them are, are somewhere below a range of uh, 10 per mil related uh, relative to zero. Um, but there's a large range in cap delta 33S on the order of, of 15 per mil. Um, so this, this is just to sort of lay the groundwork for sulfur isotopes and sedimentary rocks from before the great oxygenation event. But I'm, I'm really not a, a sedimentologist. Um, I'm, I, in the introduction, you heard I, I think about igneous rocks and geochemistry. And so I wanna zoom in to what people have, have looked at in terms of sulfur isotopes in, in igneous rocks, and in particular in multiple sulfur isotopes. So to do that, I'm gonna zoom into a much narrower range. So I'm still gonna be looking at delta 34S from maybe negative 20 to 20, but, um, but in terms of cap delta 33S, the signals we see there, um, are, are much smaller. So just to, um, to get everyone oriented, uh, we'll always sort of plot the, the more mantle or the depleted mantle. Um, so it's here with no um, cap delta 33S uh, or cap delta 33S at zero, and the delta 34S is slightly negative. Now people have looked at um, multiple sulfur isotopes with the, basically since multiple sulfur isotopes were starting to be analyzed in sedimentary rocks and, and people realized that they could be a really powerful tool to identify Archean surface drive sulfur and magmas. Um, and so the, I'm gonna show you just some examples. It's, this is not necessarily a totally comprehensive uh, data set here of, of all the um, uh, studies that have been done on igneous rocks, but just give you examples of what people have looked at. So people have looked at, um, uh, at um, uh, chromatiate hosted iron nickel sulfide deposits. So this is um, from Andre's study um, and they found non-zero cap delta 33S and also at um, uh, uh, meta igneous rocks from uh, Nuwajotuk and uh, at, you know, 3.8 billion years ago. And so you can see that there are deviations from zero in terms of, of cap delta 33S. And these have been interpreted as you know, assimilation or sourcing of sedimentary sulfur by the magmas that, that um, you know, crystallize or precipitated these sulfides. Uh, people have also looked at proterozoic igneous rocks as well. So I'm showing examples from the Bushfield complex, which are this, this sort of blue area here, and also um, uh, proterozoic rocks from, from Australia. And you can see that these um, are slightly elevated above um, zero in terms of cap delta 33S. And, and again, this is sort of interpretation as assimilation, and in some cases as a subduction of uh, sedimentary sulfur that was processed in a anoxic atmosphere. Now, perhaps the, you know, one of the things that's drawn out the most attention that's a, a really exciting possibility is the potential for deep recycling of Archean surface derived sulfur. And the main archive for this are sulfide inclusions in diamonds, which are shown in red here and also ocean island basalts, um, which are shown in green. And the reason that this is, this is exciting is because it, it means that this Archean sulfur must have been subducted to, to great depths or brought to great depths into the mantle and, were, um, and the signal has been preserved uh, in these um, diamonds or ocean island basalts, which have these deep mantle sources. So just as a sort of a cartoon of what this might look like, you can see, in the, this is uh, one idea of what the Archean sulfur cycle might look like, where you have UV radiation driving SO2 photolysis reactions. 
generating different sulfur compounds that then get deposited in the sedimentary record and ultimately subducted into the source regions, perhaps of, of diamonds down here. And so that's cool because it, it tells you a lot about, um, or potentially a lot about, um, you know, what tectonic regimes were going on, how much crustal recycling was going on. Um, but to, thus far, th this has sort of been the record. So if I come back here, we've been looking at diamonds and ocean by island basalts, um, some limited Proterozoic uh, uh, examples, uh, and also a few examples in the Archean record in terms of um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, iron nickel sulfide deposits. There's been a lot done on orogenic gold deposits as well in the Archean, which I'm not showing here, um, you know, precipitated from, uh, the sulfides are precipitated from fluid scavenging you get from surrounding uh, metasedimentary rocks. But this direct link between, um, <clears throat> between sedimentary assimilation into to magmas has not been, been studied in detail. And the reason that I'm, I'm interested in this is that um, there's a lot of processes that can can alter the sulfur isotope signature during metamorphism and then partial melting and or assimilation and you know just as an example of one of these um, desulfidization of sedimentary pyrite produces pyrotite and, uh, and sulfur bearing fluids and that loss of sulfur from pyrite or pyrotite to fluids can drive several permal fractionations between delta 34s and the residual sulfide and the fluid, and then that might be preserved in the sulfur isotopic composition of the melts that are then formed through partial melting or assimilation. Um, and you can also imagine that the, the, the uh, cap delta 33S signal, although it won't be obscured by these mass dependent fractionation processes, um, could be obscured by homogenization um, <clears throat> uh, of the, the sulfur in the source as you're partially melting it. So the, the main questions that I want to go through on the, this talk today are what are the processes that control sulfur isotope fractionation during assimilation or, or partial melting of Archean sedimentary rocks? Uh, what can the sulfur isotope record of igneous rocks tell us about assimilation of Archean surface-derived sulfur? And then lastly, um, can the igneous rock record inform our understanding of the bulk sedimentary sulfur isotope record? And if so, uh, in, in, in what way? So a quick outline of what I'll be <clears throat> going through. First, I'm gonna talk about the archive that I'm, I'm using to examine this. And the, these are strongly pyrolimitous granites. Um, and I'll, I'll get into the details of, of what those are, but you can broadly think of them as, as S-type granites. Um, I'll go into some of detailed focus locality studies, which are really um, great places to study because they preserve not only these granites, but also uh, metasedimentary source rocks that are thought to be the, um, <clears throat> the, the or metasedimentary rocks that are thought to be the source rocks or representative of the source rocks to these granites. Um, I'll then go into sort of a more global study looking at multiple sulfur isotopes in both Archean and Proterozoic strongly pyroluminous granites. And then at the end, talk about some of the implications for our, our understanding of crustal recycling in the Archean. So let's let's dive into it. So why are we looking at strongly pyroluminous granites? Um, so strongly pyroluminous granites, just to define them first, they're they're strongly pyroluminous. So they have more aluminum in them that can be hosted by um, feldspars or biotite alone. And so there has to be some other aluminous mineralogy in there. And that can include muscovite, cordite, garnet, tourmaline, and leucite, um, <clears throat> all those sorts of minerals. Um, they have generally have a high um, 87, 86 strontium radios and high 18 to 16 um, oxygen ratios as well, which are as interpreted as the part which people use in addition to their pyrolimus nature as the partial melting of aluminous metasedimentary rocks. And so the reason I'm using strongly pyrolimus granites instead of S-type is that um, S-type, uh, it, it's a more specific definition, but it also, I feel like through the, the literature has been used rather loosely. Um, and so when I'm using strongly pyroluminous granites, I'm, I've looked at the, um, these values and have, have documented that they are are indeed strongly pyroluminous um, from a chemical perspective. And also by looking at them and by looking at their, their geologic history and uh, the geologic history of the, the rocks around them and modeling of their chemistry suggests that they really are derived from the partial melting of sedimentary rocks. Um, so the, the reason that they're useful 
is that they, they do isolate the sedimentary contribution to a magma, whereas other igneous rocks have potentially many different sources of sulfur. They could have sedimentary sulfur, mantle sulfur. Um, <clears throat> so th this is, is nice because we really are getting a, a, a single sedimentary signal here. And they're also, they're really useful archives of um, the bulk sedimentary package, right? So we're not just, um, you know, looking at, at one, <clears throat> Uh, one sedimentary rock, but these these strongly perilinous granites, which form large volumes of, of magma, really do tap and homogenize large volumes of sediments. So just schematically, how do these form? You can imagine that you have sediment deposition uh, and diagenesis, and then during uh, potentially an orogenic event, um, you have metamorphism, the pressure and temperature increase, um, and then eventually you'll have uh, if it gets to sufficiently high temperatures so that you have breakdown of hydrous phases such as muscovite and biotite, you'll have partial melting and extraction and crystallization to form these, these strongly paraluminous granites. And as I mentioned before, these generally form in collisional events where sedimentary rocks are brought to depth during um, convergent and they're heated um, and eventually heated enough to, to partially melt. And then eventually when there's <clears throat> erosion we're able to go and look at these these granites and, and sample them. And I'm just showing a few pictures from the field here of these these different kinds of um, the mineralogy you see. So this is an example of one where there's both garnet and corierite in here. This is a, a nice rosette of muscovite um, in one of the actually from the Ghost Lake Bathlish, which I'll be talking about in more detail. And then you can also find you know cool minerals like tourmaline. So they're they're fun rocks to look at, um, and they're um, yeah they're they're uh, they're enjoyable to work with in the field. So where do these form? Well, in um, basically from the Neoproterozoic um, and younger, so into the, the Phanerozoic, uh, strongly perimless granites are found pretty ubiquitously. You know, they're not large volume, um, uh, uh, large volume components of um, hard junk belts, but you find them um, in a lot of different places. Um, but as you start to go back into the, the meso or paleoproterozoic and the Archean, they still do occur. Um, but it, when I started this project and started to figure out what, what I was going to look at, it took a little bit of sleuthing to, to figure out where all these localities are. And so this is a, a map that I've compiled um, showing uh, Archean crust in blue and um, paleo to mesoproterozoic crust in red. And then all the numbers here indicate different localities of strongly paraluminous granites that I've uh, found in the literature. Um, and this was from 2019. And since then, there's been a, a few other studies that have come out finding other ones. But they're found in pretty much every craton. Um, and so what I want to do is, is zoom into North America, where I've been um, looking, uh, do, doing most of my field work and also um, mo most of my samples um, that I've collected have, have come from North America, and I want to zoom into to here. And it's also where the focus localities are um, that, I, that I looked at. So first I'll sh show you just uh, an overview of Proterozoic strongly pyroluminous granites that are found here. And so they're, um, they're found mostly on the, the margins of the, the main cratonal elements or between them in, in Proterozoic, Paleoproterozoic orogenic belts. So um, for example, the up in the slave craton on the margin, you find the Hepburn intrusive suite on the in the the Watmay orogeny, in the Trans Hudson or, um, uh, origin, you find um, strongly paraluminous granites in Saskatchewan, but then all the way down to um, the Black Hills in South Dakota, and then there's a few isolated occurrences in the Mesoproterozoic um, farther in, in the into the um, into the more the southwestern U.S. Um, and then in terms of the, um, the Proterozoic focus locality, so in terms of these focus localities, I chose two different ones. I chose a, an Archean one, but I also chose a Proterozoic one um, to, to have a counterpart where we, we would and would not expect to see um, uh, non-zero cap delta 33S values um, potentially in these rocks. So trying to, trying to capture systems that tap both the pre Great oxygenation event and post oxygenation event sedimentary rock records. So again, these Proterozoic focus localities are useful because, or the the focus localities, both the Proterozoic and Archean, are useful because they they have both the the sedimentary rocks and the granites. 
Um, and the, the Proterozoic Focus locality, you're all probably familiar with it. So this is the, the Harney Peak granite, um, <clears throat> which is about 1.7 billion years old. And it um, is the granite that um, Mount Rushmore was carved into. So it's in the Black Hills. Um, and it's thought to be derived from uh, metapelites and metagraywackies deposited in the, in the Paleoproterozoic and, and really represents this sort of culminating magmatic event of the Trans-Hudson orogeny. So here's a geologic map of the Harney Peak granite. And there's, there's a lot of detail here, but mostly what I wanna um, just emphasize are these, uh, why I chose this locality. Um, so the, the Harney Peak granite is here in gray. And there's a bunch of little satellite intrusions coming out as well. And then surrounding in white and this darker gray are metasedimentary rocks that uh, are progressively more metamorphosed as you go towards the, the granite. So out here you're in chlorite grade sediments and then starlight biotite, and then you cross into the andalusite isograd and then silamite, silamonite and eventually silamonite K feldspar. Um, and so this is just an example from um, one of the starlight uh, from the sediments in the starlight uh, isograd here. Um, and so this is neat because you can actually tra track progressive prograde metamorphism um, of the sedimentary rocks and ultimately the granites that's derived from partial melting of, of the sedimentary rocks. And then here, as you get closer to the body, you can see that there are these big silenite um, uh, nodules in this schist here. Um, oh, and then lastly, just to show you, I, I, I really do, these granites are fun to work with, but these are, these are big garnets and these granites here. So just as an example of some of the mineralogy you might observe there. So that's the Proterozoic Focus Locality. I'm gonna show you a, a little bit about the distribution of the Archean strongly paraluminous granites for um, uh, North America here now. So there's um, a couple in the, the slave province. Um, so if you go down by the yellow knife pegmatite field um, in the superior province, there's actually a lot and I'll dig into more detail here. I'm just showing a few examples um, with stars here of, of where they might be located, but there, there's a, a number of localities in the superior province. And then there's also some down in the Wyoming province, both um, in the Black Hills, but then also over um, in the, uh, um, uh, over in the, by the, sorry, in, over in, um, not in South Dakota anymore, but over in Wyoming. So, um, and just one example of that, and which is another kind of fun tidbit is the uh, top of the Grand Teton is made out of uh, um, an Archean strongly paraluminous, gran paraluminous granite. So that's the Mount Owens batholith there. But I'll, I'll dive more into the superior province because that's where uh, the, the granites or the, the focus locality that I um, studied in detail is. And I wanna go into a bit more detail there. So this is a, an overview map of um, the superior province. And just a, a quick, <clears throat> uh, a quick uh, overview on the, the major tectonic elements here. Um, so the Superior Province is made up of these belts that go from southwest to northeast, uh, and they have different lithological assemblages. So in yellow and green, you might find some more that are, are dominated by PTGs and greenstone belts. You might find more some belts here like the Barrens or the Winnipeg River that are really plutonic, um, dominated by plutonic rocks. And then the, the belts that I'm most interested in are these metasedimentary ones, which are shown in blue. So the English River, the Ketako, the Pontiac, um, and um, also to some extent, the Obanaka, I haven't been up there. But in these sedimentary belts, you find um, metasedimentary rocks, but in, in many cases, they've been metamorphosed sufficiently as to partially melt and generate these strongly paraluminous granites. Um, and so the... Um, the focus locality that I looked at is that on the boundary between the Winnipeg River and the Wabagoon, there's a thin sliver of metasedimentary rocks there um, that, that host um, this, this focus locality. <clears throat> so we're, I think we're, this is maybe about the midpoint of the talk, so I just thought I'd throw in some field photographs so that um, people um, could wake up again. <laughs> um, but so this is uh, from the Superior Province. As, as Andre mentioned, I worked in Mongolia before this. So um, starting to work on um, cratons was a new experience for me, especially up in 
um, uh, in Northern Ontario. And um, so this is what a lot of it looks like, but what's actually great about this area is that the, there's a lot of logging that comes through. And so um, when these logging trucks come through, they, they absolutely rip up the land, but they expose a lot of the rocks in the process. Um, and every year they move to a new place. And so you can kind of, you can, you can make your map sequentially following where the logging operations have gone, but you're actually able to get to, to some decent outcrop here. Um, and this is just an example to, to show you that you, you are able to observe some rocks in the field. Um, also an example of some um, Caltech grad students who are, are not used to the, the cloudy inclement weather, um, but are, are doing an admirable job out there. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the, the Archean focus locality that I was looking at is this Ghost Lake Bathalus. So again, it's on the boundary between the Winnipeg River subprovince and the Wabagoon subprovince. And this is the, the Zeeland Meta Sedimentary Unit in here. And the, um, the Ghost Lake Batholith is, is a strongly paraluminous granite, or it's comprised of strongly paraluminous granite. And it's shown in these gray colors here. Um, and the, the gray colors just indicate, the different shades indicate different types of mineralogy that are observed there. In this Meta Sedimentary Unit, you can see that um, the, the grade um, increases, the metamorphic grade increases as you go from north to south here. So from biotite chlorite into andalusite, into garnet, uh, into um, sillimanite muscovite, and ultimately into sillimanite K feldspar. So again, it, it's, um, it's this great exposure of sedimentary rocks that are thought to be representative of the source rock of the ghost like batholith, um, and then the, the actual granite itself that's derived from these sedimentary rocks. And so the Ghost Lake Bathless, just to put some ages on here too, is um, 2.65 billion years old. And um, the metacenter rocks here were deposited around 2.7 um, billion years ago. So I'll just show you some more field photographs. So from, um, I'll show you one from the Andalusite grade, and then again from the Sillimanite K Feldspar grade. So there's some nice Andalusite um, uh, porphyroblast here, and then there's also this migmatization that you start to see in the sillimanite K feldspar isograd once you've um, crossed through the muscovite dehydration reaction there. Uh, and then as you get closer to the, the margin of the granite, um, you start to see, uh, or at least on the margins, you start to see some of these rafts of metasedimentary rocks basically getting digested and incorporated into this granitic body. And then when you get into the, the true heart or the middle of the granite, uh, you find um, homogenous granite. Um, this case, I'm showing you this non-homogenous picture, but just to show you that it, it has this paraluminous um, uh, mineralogy to it, but you find bitite, muscovite, and, and garnet in, in this granite. So the first thing to just go over quickly about understanding the system that we're dealing with is, um, you know, what, what type of metamorphism did these sedimentary rocks go through and how were these granites formed? And so it's actually the, the metamorphic pressures and temperatures are pretty straightforward in here. You have andalusite in these rocks. So that puts you below the, um, the triple junction for your andalusite um, uh, polymorphs. Um, so even the chlorite biotite grade, you're somewhere below 300 degrees. And then you go into andalusite grade rocks. We have biotite garnet um, thermometry for garnet bearing samples. And then what's also really nice is, is that we have um, two sillimanite isograds. So you have the um, going from andalusite to sillimanite. Um, and then you also have the K feldspar sillimanite. And then eventually you get into, um, uh, you pass the, the water saturated um, granitic solidus. So you're going anywhere from 200 degrees all the way up to um, 600 or 700 degrees uh, Celsius here and at relatively low pressures of about 0.3 GPA. Now, what uh, do this, what do the sulfides look like in this? So getting back to, to sulfur. Um, so this is just an example of um, one of the metasedimentary rocks from the sillimanite K feldspar um, isograd. And what you can see here is that it's mostly pyrotite with a little bit of, of calcopyrite in here. And what we did with not just sillimanite K feldspar grade, but with rocks selected from all the metamorphic isograds, as well as the granite, is we separated out sulfides 
um, for analysis. And uh, we, we did two different kinds of analyses for sulfur isotopes. We um, did SIMS work or secondary ion mass spectrometry here at Caltech. And this is on a Kamika 7F Geo. And then um, Patrick Beaudry um, ran analyses in Chue Ono's lab um, where uh, some of these uh, picked sulfide samples, so not bulk rock, but actually picked sulfides were fluorinated um, and, and analyzed by isotope ratio mass spectrometry. Um, I'm going to show you the results from this now and try to connect these sedimentary rocks to the, the granites that um, we also analyzed. And I'm, I'm going to show you this as um, uh, delta 34s first, and then I'll eventually get to um, cap delta 33s delta uh, cap delta 33s, and look at multiple sulfur isotopes. Um, and I'm going to show them as as histograms here, um, and I'm going to show you a couple of different kinds of data. So I'll just put up the lower grade samples first. So the the actual histogram down here are individual SIMS analyses, uh, and just the distribution of those. Then I'm also showing you the, the IRMS data as uh, the circles, the, the darker circles. And so we analyzed um, a subset of the samples from um, uh, that we analyzed by SIMS by IRMS. And I'll get into a little bit of detail about why, why we did that and why we made that choice. Um, <clears throat> and then these uh, the bars up here are averages of the SIMS analyses from individual samples. Um, and the, just to get into now why we, we decided to do multiple different measurements, I'll, I'll show you the higher grade samples. And what you can see is that the IRMS data shows an increase. So as you go from these green and blue samples up to the, the red and orange samples, there is a, a several per mil increase in Delta 34S, but it's kind of um, unclear with the, the SIMS data if anything is going on. And the, the main reason for this is that we, we encountered a lot of difficulty measuring pyrotite by, by SIMS, and especially in these metasedentary samples where it's this metamorphic pyrotite. Um, and I, the reason for this is that pyrotite, uh, or that SIMS analyses really require um, very well matrix match standards. And pyrotite presents a particular difficulty because it's non-stoichiometric. Um, and so I think there were issues with standard calibration um, for the pyrotite that we just didn't, we, either it wasn't, it wasn't behaving, the way that the, the pyrotite was interacting with the ion beam wasn't behaving the same way that the pyrotite standard was. Um, and so we, we, you know, we looked through the data and we looked at um, how yields were behaving um, and if we saw any correlations with, with raw 34, 32S ratios and tried to filter that way. But in, but in the end, we sort of had to, to go and, and get a, uh, another analysis to, to check to make sure that what we were analyzing was appropriate. So the main thing that I would take away is to mostly focus on these um, on the circles. And so what, what we do see here is that there's potentially uh, a two to three per mil increase in delta 34S from low to, to high grade samples. Um, and the way that this can be explained um, is through desulfidation, desulfidation reactions that, that occur during prograde metamorphism. Um, so the, the main reaction that we were considering here is the loss of sulfur due to pyrite breakdown um, and production of, of pyrotite and uh, an H2S bearing fluid. And this is appropriate for low FO2s where um, at, you know, at less than about the uh, one log unit below the phthalate magnetite quartz buffer, um, where sulfur bearing hydrous fluids are going to be dominated by H2S. And the, the oxygen fugacity of the specific system, I um, calibrated that in, a, in an earlier study. Um, so you can measure this um, through a simple Rayleigh distillation because we know fractionation factors between pyrite, pyrotite, and H2S. And those are this is just showing you um, the results of those those calculations. But if we start off with an initial pyrite value of, of negative one point four per mil, so that was from um, uh, the biotite chloride grade samples. And then as you go up temperature, 
and you progressively um, lose sulfur from the pyrite, you can reach the values of the high grade meta, meta sedimentary rocks. So this isn't this isn't too surprising, um, but that we we are seeing some shifts in terms of the um, the delta thirty four s as you go um, through prograde metamorphism. Now, what what do the granites look right? So let's connect the granites back to the the meta sedimentary rocks. So those are shown down here in gray now, and I'm showing you both Sims data um, and um, and IRMS data again. And what's uh, a difference in here is that in the paraluminous granites, you actually find pyrite. Pyrite is pretty well behaved on the SIMS uh, for the most part. So our, our data here um, uh, between the, IR, the two different methods ag agreed quite nicely. Um, and what you can see is that the paraluminous granite values are slightly isotopically heavy. So they're around one per mil in terms of delta 30 for us and within the same range as the, the higher grade metamorphic samples. And this suggests that they're, they're recording the sulfur isotopic composition after prograde metamorphism, and that the, the maximum um, fractionations will be on the order of two to three per mil. Okay, so now in terms of cap delta 33S here, so I'm showing you um, the samples that we did both SIMS analysis and IRMS analyses. And the reason is that the, the SIMS analyses um, on the, the 7FGO, we just, the, the fractionations were small enough that we don't, we can't get precision on that machine um, to say whether there were clear non-zero cap delta 33S values. But with the IRMS values, the precision is, is uh, you know, orders of magnitude greater. And so we, we are able to distinguish um, non-zero cap delta 33S values. And so I'm showing you both metasedimentary samples and colors here, but in the different colors represent different grades. And I'm also showing you the, the granites in gray here. And so what you can see is that the sedimentary samples have small positive to near zero cap delta 33S values. And the granites too have small positive cap delta 33S values um, that are within the range of the sedimentary samples. And so this suggests that the, the mass independent fractionation signature is being transferred and to an extent homogenized, um, but, but preserved during metamorphism and, and partial melting. Okay. Um, I think I had time to, to go into this and I think it's just an interesting case example. So I, I, hopefully we, we can talk about it at the end if people are interested in it a bit more. Um, there was one sample that was did not follow this. And so this, this is another granite sample shown in, in red here. And this is pyrite. Um, and it really displayed extreme intergrain uh, heterogeneity. So these are individual, this is just SIMS analyses, but it's it's individual analyses of, of sulfide separated from this one granitic sample. And they have, have strongly negative values. And so trying to figure out what was going on here is clearly the, the sulfur isotopes hadn't reached equilibrium in this sample. Um, and it actually makes sense if you go back to the, the field context. So this sample was taken from this hatchard area here which is a really inclusion rich zone of the Scos Lake Bathala. So you find a lot of metasedimentary like rafts of, of metasedimentary rocks and restites in this, in this zone, which is not atypical for these kinds of granites. Um, whereas all the other samples were taken from more homogeneous parts of the granite. And so what you can, you know, this is just an example of, I was going back through my, my field notes and this is a photo from the area where you can see some of these metasedimentary rocks and here's the granite, um, and this is a, a later stage tourmaline bearing uh, little dikelet that's cutting through. But the, the way that I think you can explain this is um, looking at the equilibrium between the, the, the H2S fluid that potentially is being released by these metasedimentary enclaves in here and the, the sulfide dissolved in the melt. And although there's, there's not a lot of um, uh, data for looking at, um, uh, fractionations between fluids and, and melts. Um, this is the, the best one from Adrian and Fige that I'm aware of. And you can see that the delta 34S of the fluid phase is going to be higher than the sulfur dissolved in the melt. And so the, this really isotopically, the isotopically low values that we're seeing here and the heterogeneity might be res, uh, resulting from basically this magma, including a bunch of these metasedimentary rafts, 
um, devolatilizing so that that pyrate is breaking down, releasing H2S, but there wasn't sufficient time to homogenize all of the, um, the sulfur in the, the, the granitic melt. And that the, you know, the H2S is gonna be, um, uh, in, the, in the fluid phase is gonna be heavier than the sulfur dissolved in the melt. And this is also con consistent with what we know about um, sulfide diffusion and hydrous rhyolitic melts. Um, it's, it's quite slow. And so even, you know, re-equilibrating something on the order of, you know, 10 centimeters is going to take thousands of years to, to accomplish. So that's, that's sort of the, the best working theory I have for that sample. But it's a, it's a cool example of, um, you know, looking at, at the data and trying to understand some process that's going on there. And it's easily, you can screen that by doing or, you know, in uh, individual um, analyses of sulfide grains versus um, bulk samples. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into the proterozoic focus locality too much, um, mostly because there is basically no sulfur in the system. So it was sort of uh, a good try, but, um, and this was the work that Isabelle Jeannot did um, over with Pierre Cartney, and um, we just, we weren't able to extract any sulfur from, from these samples. So we weren't, we weren't really able to study it. Uh, but quickly, so what, what did we learn from the Ghost Lake Bathlith? First, that um, in terms of delta 34S, your prograde metamorphism and desulfidation uh, via pyrate breakdown is going to cause at most sort of a two to three per mil shift in the delta 34S of the sulfides. Granites that are then derived during that, that metamorphic process retain the delta 34S of their high grade metamorphic source rocks. Um, and they also homogenize um, the non zero cap 33S value. Um, in, in the case of the Ghost Lake Bathlith, they did preserve non zero cap delta 33S, but it was, it was very small. You know, it's on the order of several tenths of a per mil. And there are um, this also suggests um, because the paraluminous granites are more or less being faithful recorders of sort of this bulk sedimentary package that they're they're tapping into is that they're they're useful records of both um, sedimentary assimilation and as sort of a proxy for for bulk sulfur isotopes of of metasedimentary rocks at this time. Okay, so I'm going to go into for the end of the talk about the a global data set that we've been putting together of these strongly paraluminous granites, um, both from the Archean and the Proterozoic. And I want to highlight that this is um, work that Jana Liebman um, has done, uh, or, and she did this for her, her PhD work. She's now a postdoc at Curtin, um, but this really represents her effort here. And um, what I'm showing here, the uh, where we got our samples from. So we have a bunch from the Superior Province, um, we have some from, um, uh, from Colorado, there's uh, mesoproterozoic, strongly paraluminous granites there, from Finland, um, from Ghana, and also from the North China Craton. Mm -hmm. So now I'm another timeline, sort of zooming into um, from, from 1200 MA to um, 2800 MA, and I'm looking at cap delta 33S. Um, again, sort of referencing the great oxygenation event here around 2.3 billion years ago. And you can see all the Archean strongly paraluminous granites here um, have uh, non-zero cap delta 33S. They're small, they're several tenths of a per mil, but they are non-zero. And then as we get into the Proterozoic, um, that signal disappears, suggesting that they um, really are preserving the sulfur isotopic signature of, of the bulk sedimentary source regions here. So how does this compare to what we know from, from other igneous rock studies? Um, so here again is all the data that I, I showed when I was introducing the talk um, and sort of grayed out a bit now. Um, and then you can see the new data from the strongly paraluminous granite, which are shown in, in black here. Um, and what you can, you can see is that um, we are um, observing small um, non-zero cap delta 33S values in here, which are similar to Archean and Proterozoic igneous rocks, like from Nwajetuk and, and Bushveld and also Australia. Um, and so while we, we are observing these, um, and I, I feel like I'm always sort of um, trying to send like a mixed message during this talk. So we, we do see non, um, uh, non-zero cap delta 33S, um, but they're small. It's, it's really, really small. And most are within 0.2 per mil of zero. 
And, and we know that these rocks are direct melts of, of Archean sedimentary rocks here. Um, and so the question is, you know, why? Um, you know, we, we really have to, to search for um, search for these uh, Cap Delta 33S signatures and these direct melts of Archean sedimentary rocks. And there's a, there's a couple of reasons why. Um, the first you can imagine in some of these scenarios is that there might be dilution of some sort of external sulfur that doesn't have uh, a non-zero Cap Delta 33S uh, signature. Um, and that could observe, obscure any um, sulfur that's being imparted to the magmas by sedimentary assimilation. That's a potential option. I think another thing too to consider is that if you go and you actually look at the distribution of Delta 33S values for sedimentary, Archean or pre-GOE sedimentary rocks, um, most of them do not preserve significant non-zero values. You know, they're within one per mil of, of zero. Um, and the other thing that could happen too is that you could potentially be partially melting um, uh, a sedimentary rock package that has both positive and negative cap delta 33S values. And that could result in a bulk cap delta 33S value of zero in the melt. And th the reason that I'm emphasizing this is that it, it leads to an important inference um, that you, while the presence of, of mass independent fractionation signatures in the igneous rock record likely does indicate the presence of, of sulfur that was processed through the Archean atmosphere, that the absence of the signature does not necessarily preclude that. And so it's sort of this reverse logic. And the reason that I'm emphasizing it, and I, I don't wanna pinpoint specific studies, but this is made a lot. And when people look at igneous sulfides, they say, okay, well, we don't see Smiths. So that means that there must not have been uh, assimilation of, of crustal materials. And then that quickly leads to, well, there is no plate tectonics. And so it's just a, it's a caveat to keep in mind um, that, you know, the, this, the mass independent fractionation signature might be small. And even if you don't see it, you still could be assimilating Archean um, sedimentary rocks. Okay, so the second aspect of this project and so one of the interesting parts of it um, that I want to point out uh, in the last few minutes of the talk is that these strongly paralimnous granites could be a useful archive for the bulk Archean sedimentary record. And they're useful because um, their, their source rocks are sort of a, a mixture of shel shelf to deep sea sediments. So a lot of these are forming um, uh, in these accretionary prisms that, uh, that are, have a lot of turbididic um, successions in them. And so you, you actually get both um, sort of a homogenations of different sedimentary lithologies. And then also um, during the partial melting process, these, these strongly perilinous granites are tapping large volumes of these sedimentary rocks. And the reason that this could be useful is that um, people have suggested that the Archean sulfur cycle is non-mass balanced um, based on the skewed, dis skewed distribution in terms of cap delta 33S. So you can see there's, there's more positive values than negative values here. Um, and what this would require if it really was non-balanced is that there's um, a, some sort of reservoir where you know, negative cap delta 33S um, you know, products from these SO2 photolysis, photolysis reactions would have to preferentially accumulate. Um, and so, you know, some people have invoked the mantle for this through subduction. So we're getting rid of all those negative cap delta 33S values. Um, but one thing to consider is that, you know, this distribution here is based on a study of sedimentary rocks um, where the, the number of measurements from each geographic locality and their temporal resolution. They're not standardized between these studies. Um, and there's also, you know, specific lithologies that are often targeted for the study of sedimentary uh, sulfur isotopes. So for example, there's a lot of sulfitic um, shales in here and they might preferentially tap uh, this positive cap delta 33S reservoir. And so the, the strongly perilimitous granites might be useful in addressing this question in, in that they average over a large volume of um, sedimentary rocks instead of isolating specific lithologies. And so I'll just show you the, um, this is sort of a last slide of, of where we're at with these, these rocks. Um, so I'm showing you both uh, pre-GOE in green and post-GOE in, in red. I'm showing cap delta 33S versus delta 34S here. 
Um, and so if we look at this, you know, I, what I would say is that I, I don't think we have enough data yet to really say anything conclusively about uh, the sulfur cycle and whether it's mass balanced. But if we were able to fill this out um, a bit more, it would be um, uh, it would be interesting to see if you know this trend where we 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 do have a lot that has small, slightly positive um, cap delta thirty three s values. If if that uh, continues to be the case, or if we find more with with more negative cap delta thirty three s values. But you know, currently we have we have twelve samples, so um, I'm not going to hang my hat on anything yet. But so a quick summary, um, and then I'm excited about opening this up to discussion. Um, so the, the strongly per, perilluminous granites, they preserve the, the sulfur isotopic composition of their protolis um, in terms of the, the high, uh, or in terms of the low grade metasedimentary rocks within two to three per mil. And then they, they once these thing, once these sedimentary rocks are metamorphosed to higher grade, it looks like the, the, the strongly perilluminous granites are, are mirroring those of the high grade metasedimentary rocks. And they are also preserving uh, non-zero cap delta 33s. Um, the absence of um, mass independent fractionation of sulfur and igneous rocks, um, I want to emphasize, does not necessarily preclude the assimilation of Archean sedimentary surface derived material. Um, I also think these, these granites are a really interesting record to potentially um, understand the bulk sulfur cycle in the Archean and that they're integrating sulfur from a lot of their, from, from these bulk siliciclastic sources. Um, and then, you know, one thing that I'm excited to do is to, to continue this um, study of a more globally distributed um, suite of these strongly paraluminous granites to investigate this a bit more. So thanks very much for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Claire. That was really great. Uh, we, we are going to go right on into the, uh, the question discussion section, uh, session here. We already have one from Paul Hoffman. Yeah. It says Andre Lalonde working on or orosyrian paraluminous granitoids in Wapme origin concluded that the igneous rocks were probably not derived by partial melting of sedimentary protoliths, but rather acquired their paraluminous character from massive contamination of metasediments or assimilation of metasediments at the depth of emplacement. Would this make any difference in the sulfur isotopes of sulfide and the granitoids? Yes, so that, that's a great question. And so there, there are some of these paraluminous granites, you know, a, a lot of them you can say, okay, they, they actually looked like they were derived fully from, um, uh, from partial melting of metasedimentary rocks. But for example, the one that, that Paul's bringing up here, the, the Hepburn um, batholith granites, it, yeah, it's more of this, like there was a massive influx of basalt or something that assimilated or, br or brought the heat in. So it's a, it's a mixture. It's not a pure sedimentary signal. And in this case, I think, yes, that, that would make a, a difference. Um, and so that's something that when you're you know, going through each of these studies, or each when you're picking out the samples to, to do the sulfur isotopes on, I, I mean, I would think very carefully about that and probably not include the ones from um, from Watme for that purpose. Um, I I don't have any samples from there. Um, I they're they're locked up in the the warehouse uh, in Ottawa, but I think that's opening up soon. So it'd be it would be interesting to potentially look at those for other purposes. But but in that case, you would be worried about sulfur from a mantle source and sedimentary source, and you wouldn't be able to necessarily say something about a purely sedimentary source. That's a good question. Thank you. All right. So anybody else who has a question, go ahead and type it into the, we have one hand up. Uh, Jingjun Liu, you can go ahead and unmute yes. yourself. Sure. Thanks, Claire. That's a wonderful talk. And I also a greeting from KGA. Always good to see Illuminati giving talk. Uh, my questions really was kind of in continuum from Karen Smith's that, that, that 2019 science paper because that really is a bombshell to me uh, when, when they're showing the Neoporous uh, diamond has a higher sulfur MIV records, uh, uh, kept at a 33 higher than the Archean run. But, um, and they're in, their, in their sample in the, in, the, in the Archean diamond, they show a similar magnitude in the kept at a 33 mm -hmm. that, 
and some of your mm -hmm. uh, granite samples. So I wonder, uh, have you measured, say, cap delta 36? Because, uh, you know, Hiroshi, take an alternative view than most of us, uh, saying that the cap delta 33 can be a result of the magnetic isotopic effect. Mm -hmm. So which, so I just wonder, do you have in that, do, is, is it possible to measure like cap delta 36 in your samples? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, I think for, <clears throat> So with the, the study that I've shown you, most of these have been from the using the, the 7FGO at Caltech. And that I don't think is um, the best way to go about 36 because it, the, the errors are just going to be quite large. Um, there is some of the data from the IRMS studies, specifically from the Ghost Lake Bathlith, where we have 36 um, sulfur data. Um, but it's uh, you know two two granite samples that we have right now, but we potentially could do that. Um, you know, thinking about the the Smith paper as well, um, I I think that's an area where you, you need to yeah. There, there's a lot of caveats with some of those interpretations there, and I especially with the the one from the um, I believe it was the Panda Kimberlites that have have very low you know several tenths of a per mil. But with an error of of zero, uh, or maybe they weren't even in with an error. I have to go back and look at the the, the methods there. Um, but those se small several tenths of a per mil, especially because those um, are supposed to have a Paleoarchean um, sulfur source region, or they they formed in the Paleoarchean from the Riemann Riemann ages. Um, and in the if you actually go and look at the the sulfur isotopes of metacemetery rocks from the Paleoarchean, they have very, I mean, compared to the Neoarchean, their magnitude of the, um, the variations in cap delta 33s are quite small um, compared to the, the Neoarchean. So, um, so I just, yeah, so I, I, it's a great question. And I think there's, there's a number of studies, not just that one, but that, that sort of use that, that inverse logic. Um, and it, it can be used in, you know, I, I think with ca cautiously, it potentially can be used, but um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, but what I'm gonna say is highly speculative, but I like really have a question about the whole sulfur MIP things because in the modern environment, we have sulfur MIP preserved in the mm -hmm. ice core. And the, the, the prevailing assumption is that the weathering process would just erase it away. So you never make it to the mantle or to the sedimentary rock in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, but but still, the, that's a, the Neoproterozoic Great Tongue of the Smith shows that one point something per mil, and uh, I, I I just I just keep bothered by this by this singularity of data. I'm not so I'm really eager to see if you can show like Neoproterozoic igneous rock that also have this or have this or doesn't have that similar mm -hmm. like enrichment because I I don't know how to explain that. It's just, to be frankly. Yeah, yeah. You know, one, one thing with the, the strongly perilous grants too is that they get messier as they get younger, right? Because they they start to tap a lot of different sedimentary rocks. It doesn't, the Archean's easy because they're, they must be from Archean sedimentary successions, but you know, you have Miocene Luca granites and the Himalayas that are, you know, tapping Proterozoic source rocks. So it's, you know, it gets, it gets tricky there. But. <laughs> Yeah, the zircons are a mess, also. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a whole. No, they they take a lot of a lot of careful sleuth work. So yeah. All right. Do we have anybody else? Feel free to speak up. We've got a pretty small, relatively small Zoom room now. Yeah, uh, Claire. Nice talk. I'm just wondering if you in your database, do you have a case of uh, sort of one phase Pluton and uh, avoiding a sort of local assimilation or rafts of metasedimentary rocks? Do you see that sulfur data would be homogenized on a scale of a Pluton or you still see variation? And what does it tell you in terms of uh, mixing in magmatic chamber or local assimilation yeah that's a great question and i think the data set that we have right now um 
is probably not not detailed enough to assess that. I mean, other than you know the ghost lake bathos, which I talked about, is the the one where we have the most replicate analyses from um, from the a single a single pluton. Um, and I think we analyzed four samples from there, and the ones that weren't associated with these metasymmetry raft did seem pretty uh, homogeneous. And then there's that one that was way off in negative delta 34s values. Um, you potentially, I, th I think it would be an interesting question um, to look at. One thing that is hard with these analyses is it, it's sort of hit or miss. Sometimes these, these granites do have a lot of sulfur in them and you can separate out pyrite and sometimes there there's nothing. Um, and so, uh, you know, finding a, a pluton where you really could go around and survey that. Um, and I think you could study it, you know, you could, you could find, um, you know, areas where, you know, it was right in contact with a metasedentary unit, look at the, the host rocks, look at the granite, um, look at variations from, from core to, uh, to rim of the granite um, or in interior to exterior. Um, but I just, we haven't done it in, in this analysis yet. So, and, and Frank, I, I'm trying to think about, you know, that we, I have these focus localities. I'm trying to think if there's other granites that I've, I've sampled in, in that much detail. Um, but, but a lot of times we've, we've gone to these different localities and taken a few, a few samples, but not, you know, not really doing the full Pluton. So yeah, that's a good question. All right. Well, if we're not getting any more questions, that was a great discussion session. Um, thank you so much, Claire, for, for this presentation. I especially appreciated the um, depth that you went into on explaining all the necessary information to really understand early on all the, all the background, um, especially helpful for me. So um, thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. And um, We'll look forward to seeing you all in, uh, we'll skip the next two weeks, so three weeks. So enjoy your, uh, your conferences and all, and we'll see you later on. All right, great. Thanks so much. I appreciate you talking. Thank you. Bye. Bye.